the extreme left. If you're not far right, you're not right enough. I'm going to reduce the corporate tax rate to 25%. The time for action is now. Don't you see the same kind of smear tactics being used by the left? Why doesn't he show his birth certificate? If the Republicans' idea of governing is just being against everything the president is for... I'm going to get rid of Obamacare. It's killing jobs. We're Americans. We make things happen. National debt went up $5.1 trillion. I've always been a Republican. And the Republican Party is a kind of a frightening, almost Cambodia, re-education camp. My name is Christopher Ponzi. I am the co-founder of Rebellious Truce. Rebellious Truce is an anti-partisan nonprofit dedicated to igniting and building a social movement for truth in American politics, media, and culture, as well as cultivating new political paradigms for leadership. Well, we're trying to eject people from what we believe is this false left-right paradigm, right? It's conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican, side against side. We're trying to get people out of that because when you really break down the foundations of those of those sides of those teams they're really built upon a lot of falsehoods manipulations and and really about division versus versus unity july 7th was the sounds of truth festival basically something that had never been done before to our knowledge in american history contemporary american history we spent about three months and when i mean we i mean the entire rebellious truce organization friends associates developing relationships with members of polar opposite political and ideological parties, groups, organizations, anything from Occupy to Tea Party, Libertarians, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and all the others in between. And we basically brought them together on July 7th, one day, over 125 of them, to participate in a legitimate human discussion. A discussion to help everyone get beyond the labels, to get beyond the perceptions that were distributed about them in the mainstream media uh, through other parties, through their so-called enemies, and basically figure out really what are the values behind these groups, who are the people, and in the process perhaps they would come together in some sort of common ground, some sort of collaboration, or at the very least some sort of mutual understanding that you know these aren't demons, these are legitimate people that care about this country and that we should all start coming together to maybe do something about it. Uh, my name's Tom Pollitt, and I'm involved with the uh, Costa Mesa Newport Beach uh, Tea Party. I'm Christian Larson, and I'm with Occupy Orange County, part of the Occupy movement. I'm Tom Hansen. I'm the uh, chair, county chair of the Orange County Libertarian Party. Giuseppe Robolino, and I identify with the Orange County Republican Party. Uh, my name is Taylor Fix, and uh, I would have to say that I'm fiscally conservative, but socially liberal. My name is Greg Diamond, and I'm part of the Democratic Party. Uh, my name is John Oaken, and I'm with the Oath Keepers. My name is Joth Houston, and I identify myself with the Occupy Movement. The objective was to bring people with different ideas and different backgrounds together and see if there was any common ground or any <coughs> common interest. Going into the Sounds of Truth Festival, I anticipated uh, a lot of tension and a lot of arguments. I was actually excited. Thought that it would be interesting, as it was. I had no idea. I kind of thought that it would be you know, a place where I knew people from different backgrounds or different political beliefs would come in and they'd all discuss uh, you know, different ways to solve problems and all that. Did I know exactly how it was going to work out? No, I felt pretty bit prepared going into it. We understood that there would be different circles for people to kind of sit down and talk it out. We get some pretty hateful responses, and some of those have come from people who self-identify as, you know, Tea Party or conservative or something. It's very, very hard to get people from different political ideologies into one area and having a discourse with each other, with e with each other without pulling out their ideological swords and trying to kill each other. Um, the format was very good and making sure that people behave themselves and don't lose their tempers and are willing to actually listen for a period of time. One major point that we wanted to bring home was to allow these groups from their own voices, you know, not through the regurgitation of some media voice box or, or the perceptions of somebody else to actually say who we are, what we value, what we're trying to accomplish, and what are the misperceptions out there that are false. Well, Michael Maxenti called me a couple months ago and uh, talked about 
his idea for this event and it was just an immediate synergy. He brought in the World in Conversation project. Uh, there is a professor at Penn State by the name of Sam Richards and his wife Lori Mulvey who created this dialogue group and I believe it's the biggest race relations conversation group in the United States but they also do things like dialogue facilitations for NATO and the UN and we had basically been given a video uh, of a TED talk by Sam Richards called a radical experiment in empathy and we all watched it here at the rebellious truce lounge and the headquarters and we we're basically blown away and we said you know what this is the kind of guy that could really you know he's onto something and we have a lot of synergy so we reached out to them and told them about the idea of the Sounds of Truth Festival and they loved it and we developed a very fast and, and productive relationship shortly thereafter. And so we brought them and about I believe six or seven young facilitators who had graduated uh, to basically facilitate these small group conversations that we were going to have with these various ideological groups. The Sounds of Truth event is radical I, I think and I think it's radical because it's so simple and I think it's so easy for people to ignore and avoid the people that have different ideas than them or live differently or have different values and so we sort of avoid each other and so the the Sounds of Truth event is really just a very simple attempt to bring us together to look at each other and talk to each other and hear from each other. One of the reasons I'm here is because I did a TED talk on empathy and and the TED talk uh, it, it's it's gotten a lot of a lot of views and the folks at, at Rebellious Truce watched it and they said hey listen maybe you could come and talk a little bit about empathy and then we talked about our dialogue project which is the, the largest university based dialogue project in the country based on the Socratic method so we don't tell people what to think and how to think but really rather just get them get us thinking about all the alternative perspectives but I want to say something about empathy. And, and when we think about it literally, it, it's, it's taking ourselves out of our shoes and putting ourselves into the shoes of another person. And, and it gets a lot of neg negative kind of uh, associations by perhaps some of you here because a lot of people think that it's, it means tolerance. Like empathy means tolerance. Like I have to accept, if I empathize with this person here, I have to accept what they're saying. It's like, no, 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 that's not empathy. Tolerance, that's begrudging acceptance, but that's not empathy. Or, or people think that it, it's, it, it, they equate it with cultural relativism, meaning that, well, everything is true and everything is valid if I simply look at it from a particular perspective. That's not empathy, that's cultural relativism. Empathy is taking myself out of my shoes and putting myself into the shoes of somebody else so that I can have a better understanding of what, in, what they're thinking, saying, and doing and why they're thinking and saying and doing those things. That's all. It's to increase and expand my understanding of my own world and my own vision. So that's a large bit of what this day is about. And so this is, the, our work is really not about getting anyone to think any one thing, and that's what Rebellious Truce is all about, but rather to say, wait, let me further develop and further expand what it is that I think that I know. And let me emphasize what I think that I know. Like I said, there's, there's a big science. So we had already planned out from those that we knew of the various groups, you know, because we wanted to make sure that if you were in a tent, it wasn't just like Occupy, 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 Tea Party, Tea Party, Libertarian, Independent. You know, we wanted to make sure that there was a diverse balance of not just uh, political ideologies, but also females, young people, old people, because this was really an intergenerational thing, interethnic, interreligious. So we really wanted to get as much diversity in every group as possible. So a lot of that was set up to to facilitate that, that diversity. We're setting up the, the Sound of Truth Festival right now at Mason Regional Park in Irvine. Today is going to be unbelievable. This will be a great day. Uh, people said it couldn't be done, that we could bring together such diverse people into here. Uh, we've got leadership representatives from Occupy, Tea Party, Democrats, Libertarians, Republicans, Democrats, uh, all coming together today uh, to share. To share what it is that they believe, to hear what others believe, and to help clarify what we all share together. You know, there is no success or failure. Uh, at the end of the day, the mere fact that we're all attempting this, I think, is a step in the right direction. We are very anxious, excited to see what's going to happen today. We had no freaking idea, like, who was going to show up. It's like planning a party that you know you send out all the emails and the phones you can some people say yes some people say no then the people are canceling and you know dealing with 
again, various political parties, you know, we're going to like meetings of all these various groups, we're going to potluck social and, you know, social engagements, you know, doing meetups, all the online thing, and, you know, you just hope for the best. And some of these groups are so closed off, they're so sort of paranoid to some degree that they're going to be co-opted or, you know, they don't know who you are, if they haven't heard of you, you have to develop this whole credibility. So you just really have no idea. Besides that, there's a huge amount of planning. We chose a very beautiful park setting, very harmonious, beautiful sunny day in Southern California. Um, you know, there's really a, like a profound science behind creating these harmonious atmospheres where everyone feels welcome and their opinions uh, valuable. We had food, diversity of food, we had music, we had artists. You know, we had a lot more people show up than, than we originally intended. So, you know, we had to basically make do there. So people came, it was a circus before everybody got there, setting up these tents, these banners, you know, we really, really did it up. And, you know, people started showing up in droves and then, you know, we had them take seats, the, the facilitators started having conversations with them and we're running around, you know, making sure every, all the little nuances are done. And then we had a series of speeches, uh, one was with myself and my co-founder Mike, that we sort of, you know, wanted to start the day off to really set the tone of our personal journey and how really this event is in some degree a replication of that journey that we took and of the positive conclusions that we're, that we're still living through today. beginning of the mid-twenties on, accelerating wave of speculation. The market was going up, and the expectation that it would go up more caused it to go up more. But then comes the day... We're here to tell a story. Something changes those expectations, and everybody wants to get out. Why we're here, what started all this. That is not a matter of weeks or months. That's a matter then of days. The crash comes very fast. We're here to tell a story. First is introduce a little bit about rebellious truths, and to do that, I'm going to invite Chris Ponzi and Michael Maxeni, uh, the two co-founders of Rebellious Truths, to kind of give you the background and how Rebellious Truths came to be. So, give them a round of applause. Our uh, our journey started two years ago last month. Chris was a uh, doing some freelance writing for my magazine, and came into my office one morning to talk about a freelance project, and. The night before, Sylvia and I had had one of many ongoing political discussions, and Chris had met Mike over the years many times and said, you know, so what's happening with Mike? And I told him about our discussion the night before. Well, something I said set Chris off. Uh, I saw a side of Christopher that I didn't know existed. Uh, Christopher had anger and just a side of him that was just angry and he started just going at me about how my generation had stolen his future, had corrupted the nation, had polluted the world, uh, on and on. And I said, Chris, Chris, if you want to talk politics, I'll be glad to. Little did he know that I was a political science major. I've been reading politics all my life, thought I was fairly well versed in it. So I said, Chris, if you want to talk politics, I'll be glad to meet you for lunch. Well, that evening, I get home, and to his credit, there's an email there. Mr. Maxini, will you meet me tomorrow for lunch? Okay. So I was really anxious to talk to Mike because unbeknownst to him at the time, I had already begun my own political and intellectual journey. Basically, after the hardest year and a half I've probably ever had after graduating from UCLA. In the peak of the recession, no doubt, and my stepmom had lost her job, my dad had lost his job, both my mom and my stepdad had taken a huge hit financially along with friends and family. At one point I was working four menial jobs just to stay afloat, and just a whole bunch of other stuff that basically led me to question like what was happening in this country and, and beyond, what was really going down, I didn't understand it. And after a few conversations with Mike and over the years, I, I admittedly thought like here's this typical 
Orange County wealthy businessman in his bubble who doesn't, who thinks that basically anybody who doesn't think like him is, or not successful like him is lazy or stupid or immoral. I never said stupid. Or something, <laughs> something to that effect, you know. And I was really anxious to basically share my own personal experiences with him and my own political knowledge and basically wanted to argue with him, but that was my original intention of going out. So that's what kind of went down the next day. Well, little did Chris know that that appearance of success that once was there in reality, since the depression, they call it recession, screw that, it's a depression for everybody who's living it. Uh, little did he know that I sold a house that I had built and had lived in for 22 years to come up with the cash to take care of my mom and dad who I took out of a nursing home uh, to provide for them and to feed my business which had been losing money never lost money ever until 2008, 9, 10 it was going down and I'm pushing money into it to try to figure out a way to survive it myself but he didn't know that but when we sat down for lunch that day uh, the next day I brought out my iPhone and I put it on the table and I put out 45 minutes on the timer and I said, Chris, when this goes off, whoever's talking can wrap up what they're saying, the other person can respond, and then I gotta go back and make a living. By the time we'd finished talking, at 45 minutes later, and, he, and we started off, I forget the issues that came up, didn't really matter, but he'd say and I'd respond with something and say, well, nobody's ever so explained it to me like that. And then he'd somewhat come up with some other wild ass thing and I'd say something else. And he'd say, well, why does people speak like that to real people? Why can't I? Now, that makes sense. He had a couple By, of out there thoughts to himself. <laughs> By the end of that lunch, we knew something had been sparked between us. Yeah, it's true. And, and something had been sparked. And so we decided to meet the next week. And after that talk, it became the week after that. And then the week after that, it became every week with emails and changes in between, phone calls in between. And Mike knows this, he infuriated the crap out of me. Like, crap, I, are you the shit you sent me that I had to read? Oh, man. It's, yeah, it was one of those, but it, admittedly neither one of us, I think, had ever really truly listened to the other, to basically his perspective side, our sides. Um, we had kind of stuck to our own particular sources, our own friends, our own environment. And, you know, I think what we were talking was probably just the same regurgitation of the same cliches you hear in the media and whatnot. But there was an undoubtable mutual respect between us. You know, Mike actually listened and read what I had to say and give him, and likewise. And I think, most of all, he definitely was a man who genuinely cared about the world and the country. And I think in a land of apathy, that means something in general, just somebody who actually cares. Um, so, and after all these exchanges over the course of a couple months, something unique began to present itself. What began to present itself that we began to understand was a couple of things. But first, I want to back up for a second. One of the things that Chris did for me when I was his age, when I was back in college, back in the 60s, <laughs> uh, I had, uh, you know, I went out and participated in marches. I thought of myself as a card-carrying SDS member. Uh, you graduate from school, you go get a job, you start making a living, you, you get a family, you start taking on responsibilities. And what most of you all have heard many, many times is the, the old cliche or saying that says, you know, everybody starts off liberal when they're young, but when they get into the real world, have to start paying taxes, have responsibilities. Over time, just be patient with them, they'll become conservative. And most do. But what I might take on that that Chris made me realize was it wasn't that we become conservative because we believe in that. It's that what we do is we're willing to walk away from our idealism of what the world should be, what we could make the world. We begin to accept it for the way it is. We find our spot in the world. We go out and choose our path, try to create our own success in our own family and our own happiness. And what we really do is don't become conservative because we're believing in it. It's because we've been beaten down and walked away from our idealism and we accept the world as it is. So that was one of the biggest things Chris did for me, was he re-inspired me in myself and the commitment that I needed to make to help make this world a better place, because as we all know here, it's not working for more than half the people. The vast majority of people, it's not working for. When we begin to peel back the labels that he 
had been taught from the time he was a child through school, his school books, his videos, all sources of credible information for him. When he had, when we peel back the labels of these words that he had been taught to associate. And likewise, likewise, Mike as well. His labels, his words yeah, as well. well yeah. And that's a good point. Because I really began to see the world and step outside of my conservative world and truly try to get into Chris's world and understand why he and my son Silvio, who I had thought gone to the dark side, why they were thinking the way they were because something wasn't right. And so after months of, of weekly and many evenings and exchanges, we both began to realize that when you peel back the layers of all these labels that divided us, that were mostly false labels, we really realized that there was something incredible that we shared. So we continued to test our previous convictions, question our beliefs, which even for the most fearless of us, and I guarantee you there's probably a lot of fearless people here, is very tough. It's very tough. But as we continued to do this, we began to get outside of our bubbles. We began to, you know, explore different sources, talk to different people, really sort of eject ourselves from what had been the norm, the status quo, and we began to realize that many of what we had held before were built upon faulty foundations, manipulated facts, superficial labels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And through this process, we began to care less and less about our perspective sides, about winning, about being right, and all that other things that you get inundated with constantly, and, and more about the pursuit of the fact-led truth, A, and B, the people, just people, you know, sins, sins labels, and while we still differ greatly Always. to this day, anybody who can choose can tell you there are spirited discussions on the weekly, and that's okay, but one thing we did agree on then, and we do agree on now, is that something has to be done, and it needs to be done now, and we need to do it together. And that together, folks, is what we're sharing the story of our journey that continues and this day is part of that. We've invited you here to share who you are with each other and begin to listen to each other. And hopefully today you'll start your journey to understanding and that journey will help us all lead to the solutions that will bring our nation back together. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Enjoy the day. With all these groups, you know, let's say you're out there, you're, you're an Occupy, you're a Tea Party, you're a Libertarian, you're a Democrat, you whatever, go down the spectrum. You probably have an enemy, right? Or something you perceive as an enemy. But, you know, when I was sitting down with all these people, and, and as I've continued to sit down with all these various groups all the time now, you know, everyone there cares. They care. And I think in a land of apathy, right, that we're sort of stewing in, anybody who cares, like legitimately, and whether they care in a different way, that's another story, but they care, deserves my respect, deserves your respect. First of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, I am part of the OCGOP Youth Associates program. I'm a Republican, conservative Republican. The Republican Party's core, core principles lie on limited government, s social values, and a strong work ethic and ethic of personal responsibility. We don't want to alienate everyone, even though that is the dialogue that seems to be going on in Congress right now. All we really want is to be able to make laws and get, uh, get the progress that we need to bring our country forward just the way that we feel our founders intended it to be. Uh, typically the media, uh, what they do, if you see, even when you see regular news reports on TV, it, it is always pandering to emotion, it is always pandering to uh, look how this person has been hurt by a company, by a private individual, or is being hurt by whether it be like a housing development, being displaced by that. It's always in some way pitting an enterprise or someone who in our minds is, we view as somebody with more power. It's always pitting that entity against the regular citizen. We are an exceptional nation, unlike any, uh, any other nation on earth, and because of that, there are particular rules that we have to abide by. So, thank you very much. The media has definitely misrepresented the Oath Keepers. Um, they misrepresent everyone. The Oath Keepers is an association of active and retired law enforcement, military, first responders, 
um, essentially anyone who's taken the oath to the Constitution. That oath is not to any political party, it's not to any politician, and it's not to any corporation. Okay? It's about the Constitution, every issue, every time, no exceptions, no excuses. They like to lump uh, Oath Keepers with you know, white supremacists and KKK and white Aryan and, and all these radical, so-called radical right-wing groups. And you know what? We're not, we are not that. We are, it's a peaceful movement. Uh, it's nonviolent. Uh, if we have members that, that want to go that way, we'll throw them out. So, the Constitution. Uh, Michael Badnarik sums it up in seven simple words, okay? Don't hurt me and don't take my stuff. The principles of the Occupy movement center around reform and reducing corruption and promoting economic justice and social justice, generally speaking. I'm going to give you a secret weapon to use against the Occupy movement, all right? Imagine this, someone gets off work, they're running to City Hall, uh, they try to cram a really thought-provoking statement to a piece of cardboard, vehicle pulls up, the driver unleashes the checkmate. Get a job, hippie! Right? He pulls away. But I'm not mad at that guy, you know, because he's given up his humanity. Humanity is what makes us want to come together and figure things out together. Uh, it's the foundation for democracy where we act on what we figured out. Um, I joined the Occupy movement because I saw they valued democracy and humanity above all. I was amazed that was a place where anybody, including a homeless person, could come, their opinion would be heard and valued. Uh, we shared meals and we learned about possibilities that the two parties haven't offered us. Uh, but I'm also kind of a hypocrite because when the Tea Party started, my first thought was not, let's go talk to them. My first thought was, let's forward my friend's galleries of misspelled Tea Party signs. Nobody else did that. <laughs> Flash forward a year later, big event in Irvine City Hall, there's a newspaper photographer coming down the line and I realize I'm pretty sure I misspelled the word bureaucracy on my sign, right? <laughs> I'm freaking out. Should I, should I hide the sign? Because I know I'm going to be that guy that passed around on the internet, look at this Occupy idiot. He thinks he can run the country. And then I spell bureaucracy, right? That's what it's come to because we have a huge deficit of humanity. Uh, it's, I think it rivals our financial deficits. And with that deficit of humanity, we end up with fake democracy, where you have $11 billion pumped into this year's election to misinform people, to give them false choices. Uh, would you like TARP 1 or TARP 2? Do you want a trillion dollar year military or would you like something more expensive, right? One of the common misunderstandings of the Occupy movement is that when people hear the cries for social justice coming from us, they think that means we want to give favoritism to the underprivileged people over the privileged people. But that's not the case. We do want true equality for all people regardless of economic status. 90% of Americans, excuse me, are disapprove of the job of Congress and 80% think that Congress has been corrupted by Wall Street. So my last question is, how do they maintain power with those kind of numbers? I think they gotta make sure we hate each other and they gotta make real sure we never come together to have a picnic. So, thanks very much, God bless. We believe that government is not the answer, it's the problem. We just, uh, we're just regular people that have finally said enough is enough. And, uh, they want to make us out to be radical and on the right. Uh, we just want our grandchildren to, to grow up in the same, uh, same country that we grew up in, uh, with the same freedoms, the same opportunities. We see opportunity uh, being limited uh, by more government control. Uh, the larger government gets, the more control they take of our lives, the more they uh, regulate our lives and tell us what to do. We've been portrayed as right-wing crackpots, conspiracy theorists, um, that we would allow corporations to take over and grind everybody under their heel. What do we represent? Um, we believe that freedom basically has two main continuums. There's economic freedom, which you can and cannot do with your money, and then there's a social freedom, which you can and cannot do with your life. We believe that you should have as much of both as humanly possible, as long as you do not step on other people's toes or infringe upon their rights. Libertarians, I'd say, it's a philosophy of um, non-aggression, it's a philosophy of uh, peace, a free commerce and trade, and social tolerance. That's what it has. Thank you very much. As you can tell, public speaking is my favorite thing to do. The media narrative about the Democratic Party is often that we are weak, uh, that we're unable to govern. We want to be able to uh, advance, uh, to protect people, and to advance principles. I think that largely what we're about is trying to promote fairness and to decrease suffering. 
uh, among people. We are opposed to desperation. We're in favor of there being a floor level of support for people in the government. Yes, that means some taxation, etc., but it allows people to make their decisions based on their aspirations, based on what they think somebody more powerful wants them to do. There was a speaker at the lunch break. David Walker, where, where, where's, where's David? David M. Walker was the U.S. government's top auditor, its comptroller general for 10 years, and the spectacled sire of the Government Accountability Office. He puts no stock in party labels and wants to help rebellious troops put a coffin on bitter partisanship, misinformation, and ideological divides. That was Mr. David M. Walker. I'm here because Michael McSenty asked me to be here. He's just a G, let's put it down like that. Um, he was in our debt bomb video, which is to date the most popular video we have. Um, just an outstanding individual who talks a lot about the fiscal facts and what's really happening with, with the government's finances and why that is a big deal. And he's a nonpartisan guy. And you know, he really took a chance on us in the very beginning of lending his credibility to, to our movement. And so he spoke for briefly about some of the fiscal things about himself and about sort of the political situation and our need to come together. And, and do something about the plight that is growing in this well, I've been involved in rebellious crews for a while now, and I'm featured in one of their videos. And they're obviously trying to help make sure that we get the truth out and that we mobilize a range of people, especially young people, uh, so that their voice can be heard and we can improve them. I love my country, but I'm very concerned about its future. I'm very concerned about the future for my kids. And I got married at 19, have been married with, for, with the same woman for 41 years. I'm greatly concerned about my grandkids. In, in my view, we're a great country, and I've had the good fortune to travel about 100 countries around the world in my various responsibilities, but we're not as great as we think we are. We have strayed from a number of the principles and values under which the country was founded and made us great. Principle and values like limited but effective government, individual liberty and unlimited opportunity, personal responsibility and accountability, rule of law and equal justice under the law, fiscal responsibility and intergenerational equity, and let me mention an important word, and that word is stewardship. It's a word that you don't hear enough. And what does stewardship mean? It means that our jobs as leaders, no matter where we are, is not just to generate positive results today, not just to leave things better off when you leave than when you came, but to leave things better positioned for the future. The truth is, is that we have a republic that is not representative of or responsive to the public. That a vast majority of the people who are elected for federal office today have not had a real job in their life. And rather than being there to do temporary public service and to represent we the people, they view it as a job, they want to make a career out of it. A vast majority of our congressional campaigns are in non-competitive districts, which means you know if a Democrat or Republican is going to win, you just don't know which one. You have a situation where special interest, whether they be corporations, whether they be unions, whether they be a variety of others, have a disproportionate amount of, uh, of authority and influence on those who view their position as a job. And like most individuals, you don't want to lose your job involuntarily. And therefore, they're afraid to tell people the truth. They're afraid to take on tough choices until there's a crisis at the doorstep. And then what do they do? Rather than lead, they exhibit laggardship. We all know about the national debt clock. It's now at $15.8 trillion. 
by the way, was only a little over $5 trillion 12 years ago. Uh, it is going up at record rates. But that number lowballs the problem. Because to that number you have to add unfunded civilian and military pensions and retiree health care. You have to add unfunded promises for Medicare and Social Security and a range of other commitments and contingencies. And when you do all of that, the number is more like $70 trillion and going up by $10 million a minute. Now it doesn't have to be that way. We still have time to restore fiscal sanity, but we also face a number of other challenges. We don't have an energy policy in this country. We don't have an environmental policy in this country. We don't have an immigration policy in this country. We don't have an infrastructure policy in this country. Uh, and frankly, we don't have a health care policy in this country. My view is, as I participated today and will continue to participate today, is that while we've got diverse groups, whether it be Democrats, Republicans, you know, whether it be the Tea Party, uh, you know, whether it be uh, the uh, Oath Keepers, uh, whether it be uh, Occupy, whether it be the Libertarian Party, whether it be Ron Paul's group, or whatever it might be. Even though we have these different groups, we all want to make things better. And we all know that we don't have enough truth, we don't have enough transparency, we don't have enough integrity, and we don't have enough accountability. We need to work together to try to come up with sensible solutions, nonpartisan solutions that can achieve bipartisan support. I'm a political independent. 40 to 42 percent of registered voters are now political independents, up for 20 percent 20 years ago. You know, we need to make sure that we're coming up with nonpartisan solutions that can get bipartisan support. We need to do it sooner rather than later. I think just getting people together, that was a huge objective. Like the fact that people were willing to agree to this, and again, it was no easy task getting them here, was a huge step. So already having that many people was like a huge accomplishment for us. We're like, great, you know, it's possible just to even bring them together in the same place willingly, and they know willingly what they're getting themselves into. Secondly, it was really about seeing the other side perceive the other as humans, all of a sudden giving them the complexity, the nuance that is humanity. And we definitely saw that. I mean, all the feedback that I got, at the very worst, it was like, wow, that was really interesting. But at the best, which was also a big surprise, it was like, wow, like what I once thought was impossible is possible. I played the facilitator. In, in that role, it was uh, really about trying to move the conversation along. I think that there's, there's a ton of people with a ton of different backgrounds that everyone wanted to get those points across. It was my job to try to give ample time for everyone to be heard in order that those ideas may inform, may influence, or may even inspire some of the other people in the groups who haven't considered those things. As a facilitator, I consider success literally just participation, people willing to share what's on their, on their mind and being honest with each other. And uh, I think as a facilitator, I just consider myself somewhat of a bridge, I guess. You know, a lot of times political events are kind of charged. They can be very um, contentious. So I was a little concerned that people wouldn't really be open to dialogue. I expected, um, I expected difficult groups. I expected it to be uh, people to be very apprehensive, passionate and apprehensive. Remember that this is about understanding each other rather than understanding um, a platform or a party. I think all I wanted to achieve was for people to be able to be less afraid of approaching one another and talking to one another. And, you know, I think maybe in the beginning of the, of, the, of the festival, of the event, there was a little bit of awkwardness or apprehension. And I think as soon as people started talking to one another, they started to just be like any other group of people, like really having more commonalities and differences. And I don't want to stress that too much because I know the, the differences are important, but I think Suddenly, it was like, we're all three-dimensional people. We're not just represented by what shirt we're wearing. And I think that came through really powerfully. Real quick, understanding is the word. So the mission of the conversation, that the kind of conversations we're gonna have today, often when we come together with different perspectives, think about your lives, think about your families, think about your relationships, you often are, we're often trying to 
prevail, win the argument. Here, our, our very simple mission is just to try to understand the argument on the other side. And I put argument in quotes, okay? So really, when we're, when we're together in these groups, our group collective mission is to try to understand what the heck these people are thinking, right? And, and really, ultimately, then really, what do we want as Americans? get properly educated. Rebellious Truths wants us to become bullshit detectors, learn to ask the right questions, seek out the truth. Too many get their information from the mainstream channels, but the major media companies are owned by only a few massive corporations that have an interest in making profits by promoting extremism, selling sensationalism, fear, pinning sides against one another, and discrediting anything that attacks their agenda. It's not mainstream media, it's corporate media. And it's not news, it's a public relations beast. Just turn on the TV. Campaign slogans, competing lies, partisan sound bites, talking heads, political disconnect, ideological bickering. <laughs> the same repetitive shit over and over again. <laughs> it's at best an insult to our intelligence, at worst, manipulation. We must question everything. Seek out diverse sources of information, media, and facts to cipher out the static of the status quo. Rebellious Truths will provide some of these important resources through its videos, website, allies, and community. But seek as much as you can. And question us too. Corruption in this country has basically kicked us in the naughty parts, stolen our wallets, and spat on us while we're down. Yet instead of being punished, the guilty get a pat on the back and a license to keep doing it. Pissed off? Naturally. But let's not start squawking blame at every so-called poor-hating Republican or pot-smoking socialist Democrat but instead recognize that both parties and their accomplices are slipping us stupid pills while they silently take advantage of us in the dirty darkness of backroom politics. So how do we protect ourselves from the dangers of ideologically transmitted diseases? organizing and promoting a protest movement against the U.S. government. Didn't you hear Limbaugh started by saying he wanted Obama to fail? The Obama administration and his loony tune of economic advisors have an unnecessary regulation from a government that's always micromanaging tax increases I think are off the table. He banned the president. Start a simple exchange of understanding. Sit down with someone, liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican, and try to mutually understand one another. Agree on the facts and problems. Utilize your rebellious truths education and come to an agreement that satisfies everyone. It's about time we said we're done being divided, that we're done being the playthings of the corrupt. So what we have going on here behind me are eight different discussion groups, conversations, and the groups are populated by people with different political perspectives and agendas being facilitated by facilitators from the World in Conversation Project and who all also have very different perspectives and we're trying to see what kind of conversation comes up in the middle of the group. And so I think what I'm going to do is walk around on the outside of some of these conversations and see what I hear and then maybe I'll throw my own take and my own spin on some things that are really emerging out of the dialogue. So, so let's go. Let's let's start with this one right here. Yeah. yeah what thing is on your mind? Obamacare is the biggest thing on my mind. Um, you know, the government getting involved in one sixth of our economy and basically telling us you have to uh, have health insurance. Yeah, you, you have, have to have fine, a health insurance, yeah. and if yeah, you yeah. don't, you're going to get fined. Whether we call it a penalty or a tax, I don't care. And, um, and, and, and to boot, uh, the government's going to tell us what the policies need to look like, are going to look like, that, uh, that, you know, that we have to buy. You know, it has to have A, B, C, and D, the, the government is now telling very us. Cookie cutter. Remember that, that the very first uh, political discussion group I was at, there was a conservative gentleman to my left, and he kind of, you know, had the smirk and, and uh, really kind of set heavy with his, his stance, but kind of towards the end, he, was, he gave a little leeway, which, uh, 
I think is a lot compared to how I first saw him, that even a little, because most of the time you don't get any leeway with people that are really hard set on their side of the political, you know. Yeah, uh, no, it's scary. And, and, and yeah, it's, but it's I, crazy. I, I feel like that's part of what we need to do as a country because there are so many people who don't have health insurance, who can't afford it, who don't have a job, or who do have health insurance and then get taken off when they get sick. And I feel like there are so many other countries who I feel like have figured this out. Why are we unable to create a healthcare system that works for everybody, or at least 90% of the people Look, that is affordable? Look, if you think that a government-run healthcare system is going to work for everybody, but if take a look it, at Social Security. Why have we not had any health at, insurance reform that has been able to we need, work for We us. need reform that opens up, that, that, that creates a real functioning open market for healthcare so that people can afford healthcare. Mm -hmm. Absolutely we do, but we do not need the government getting involved in healthcare. You think that can be done without government regulation? It hadn't been. Yes, I think it can be. I don't think we'll ever get to it. A place where 100% of the people will will be able to afford health care, but that's not the society we live in. We live in a society where there are some people that have less than other people, and that's all. That's the way it's going to be if you want to be live in a capitalist system. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and if people can agree on on the the same truths, and and you know this is a blue shirt or it's not a blue shirt. I mean, that's pretty obvious. And, and if we can agree on the obvious things, then I think we can have a good dialogue. But if we come in with uh, misperceptions, um, preconceived ideas, uh, it makes the, the conversation difficult and coming together difficult. I'm not saying that, you know... But there are other provisions there. With everyone's always going to need health care. Right, and I'm not saying like, you know, yeah. oh, there's always going to be five... Everyone people. needs no. food, so is the government going to also uh, uh, d d determine that everyone gets food and everyone, yes. everyone needs housing too? Everyone yes. needs housing, food, mm -hmm. health care, yes. so now the That's government's going to guarantee all of, all of that? Because they're doing a really good job of guaranteeing. Sounds, sounds good to me. Yeah. yeah that's nice. that's <laughs> so, uh, so wait, Sandy, that else does that sound good to you? That's, who, who else does that sound good to? Basic rights? Yes. I, I, I wait, totally agree. Oh, that's, so, that's you, not a housing, food, that right, and health. Basic people, rights. Basic, you're basic saying rights? basic provisions, right? Is that what you. I, think, I don't know. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's not a right. right. I think, I think. Um, the format was very good and making sure that people behave themselves and don't lose their tempers and are willing to actually listen for a period of time. So, what, what are some other thoughts? about what's broken and how might we fix it? Two yeah, things, financially, um, corporations are not people in, in most Americans' eyes, but they've become that way. They're legally ensconced in that way. That has to change. Since Citizens United, we're, we're seeing it in our campaigns. It's a campaign year. It's uh, disastrous. The people are not having their voice heard. Special interests and corporations are pouring money into basically buying our leaders, electing our leaders, buying them, really. Um, the other thing is the rich are uh, evading tax. I'm not I'm not a communist, I'm just saying the rich, if we're paying taxes, the rich should pay their tax. And they've they found so many great loopholes. Uh, the concentration of wealth has basically doubled or tripled. There's now more than a thousand billionaires in the world, as opposed to 10 years ago, there was a few hundred. So that's, that's ridiculous. So. What do you think is the solution? Uh, the laws have to change. Uh, people have to get more educated. Um, also, culturally, we're very skittish. We're a two two second attention span nation. Um, it doesn't help that five year olds know more about the Kardashians than can't name the first president of this country. So um, we need to. Chloe, right? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> right. So no, we need to educate the youth, and we need to. Sit down and have more conversations like this. But we need to get more involved. We need to be more activists, really. So you know, here are these two very, very completely polar opposite people, but they're going to agree on this idea that the country's broken, and here's why. He used to be able to make it, and now he can't. And, and just that, just that alone is, is really extreme. I mean, it's phenomenal, right? But, so that's, that's interesting. Let's go. Let's, let's come back. It's important to understand that that people need to seek out formats like this so that you can learn more about each other. So you're saying the Constitution is just a goddamn piece of paper? No, I think there's um, a lot of room for improvement, but when it comes to uh, when it comes to the uh, the right to um, to not be uh, detained indefinitely, I think that's good. We should keep that. 
but but there's but you're not willing to go as far as George's. Well, I've noticed with uh, and I made this comment at the last group. When it comes to people's perception of the Constitution, people generally like to selectively pick and choose what aspects of the Constitution they like. For example, I think gay marriage is protected under the Constitution. I don't think you need to make any laws or regulations. Government is the impediment towards gay marriage mm -hmm. because you need a marriage license yeah. to get married. Can you just can you tell us? And I think I, it, I'd like us to kind of move in this direction a little bit. How did you get to the, where you are right now? That you grabbed onto the ideas that you grabbed on about the Constitution and about the, well, and through my, my family's experience, my family went through a lot of things that you know would make a lot of people, regardless of their political philosophy, cringe. My mom. Uh, raised me as a single mom. Uh, my dad, when my mom divorced my dad, he decided he didn't want to be a father anymore. My mom worked in the banking industry and she would oftentimes find that she, people whom she trained, men who, men whom she trained, would end up being promoted above her. And so rather than jump on board with any particular political uh, movement or whatnot, she decided, like LeBron James, to take her talents to somewhere else where it would be appreciated more. And she moved into a different career that she felt was more rewarding to her. Um, I've always found in my life the solution did not come from um, relying on someone else to fix it for for me, but relying on myself to either find a better solution or to pull a, and sorry to say this Cleveland, if anyone in Cleveland is watching this, to take my talents somewhere else where they'd be appreciated better. Mm -hmm. In this regard, this is what still makes America a great place, is um, what, what was the impetus for anything? Civil rights movement? or Montgomery bus boycott, which one had a bigger punch to the man, per se. Jason, how did you come to the, uh, your release and your ideas um, in terms of, we need, you know, you said we need to go back to uh, this decision. How did you come up, you know, how did you come to these, uh, these ideas? Um, it was shortly after I got involved in Occupy, I started to realize that I didn't know as much about politics as I, um, as perhaps I should um, wait, participate. Let, let me ask in you though, but that, that's actually really important. Like, how did you get to Occupy? Like, what? I just found it one day. And what happened? Um, you mean you just like saw a bunch of people and yeah. you just jumped in? Yeah, that, that's that's how it happened actually. What? Ha how? And what made you? What yeah, made like, you? A lot of people wouldn't see a bunch of people. What made you so comfortable maybe, um, with being involved with those particular people? Because I hear they're strange. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I, I've never met a nicer, more welcoming group of people and a more supportive group of people and I have some personal issues they were I they were very nice people um, and so I, I grew a lot during my months with Occupy but that's a completely different non-political story I'd also like to point out that um that well actually I'm interested in that if you are okay with sharing it what uh, how did you I think yeah I think it's important and I don't think it's, it's actually yeah. outside of the scope of what we're talking about um, well, I, as you can probably tell, I get really nervous around people sometimes, and uh, Occupy helped me a lot with, um, with getting less nervous. So. And, and so having met this group of people that were supportive and kind and whatever, then you started opening up to the ideas and learning. Yes, yeah, sort of. Learn. I'd or like to point learn. out that we're not all autonomous individuals and we're not all self-reliant and if, even if you can't find a niche and no one who appreciates your talents, that doesn't mean that you don't have worth as an individual and you shouldn't be supported um, during dark times in your life, mm -hmm. even if that's kind of the conservative point of view or at least what I've gotten of it. That's actually a powerful statement. Can we, can we, can we respond to that? So, I mean, are you, so just let me say, so that's a characterization in your mind for the other side. I mean, didn't Glenn Beck say that in nature lions eat the weak or something to that effect? Can we, can we respond to this idea? Um, I'm going to put something on the again? record What's in Glenn the Beck. The, the yeah. idea that there is, there is a, a self-reliant, you should do it yourself, forget about taking care of each other. This is I'm, a more conservative I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make this statement. Glenn Beck oh. likes to use the word libertarian. He's standing right here. I'm going to take the word libertarian from him. He's not allowed to use it anymore. Okay. He's not <laughs> a very good leader. Conservatives so can, do, we, they, they, they do agree in a safety on. net. They, they absolutely do. Um, so you're disagreeing with Yeah, I absolutely disagree. And, and, but they also support things, I believe, that um, help with that safety net, like um, religion and other organizations that will help with that versus relying on the government, which ultimately becomes corrupt, starts using, um, you know, their, the system in order to create power for themselves. Let's Actually, it's, it's, um, they're using the system to subject you to a mm -hmm. jurisdiction that's foreign to our Constitution. 
That was one of the accusations that our founding fathers had against the King of, King of England was subjecting us to a jurisdiction which is foreign to our Constitution. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about the Republic thing and, the, and the, the Bill of Rights or the Bill of Restrictions, it says the government shall not, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, in, in a Republic, because your rights are elevated above that of the corporate body, I don't have the right to vote. I don't even have the right to vote on whether Takim has the right to speak or assemble. It's off limits. There's no question to that in a in a uh, in a republic, but in a democracy, mm -hmm. all of that goes askew when you give it to the corporate body and you start letting them make all your decisions for you. Free speech sounds. I was uh, impressed at, at the the level of um, empathy that people were able to uh, impart on, on even people that they didn't agree with at all, um, and I think at the end of the day. What I learned is that people truly do care about solutions and outcomes. And uh, even though they uh, may disagree with each other um, on the surface, that deep down they really want to come to a solution. I thought that uh, it was going to be tough, but surprisingly it really wasn't. I mean, people were very civil and respectful of each other, respectful of each other and uh, I left being very encouraged that we could definitely move forward collectively. We look at liberals and Democrats, or conservative Democrats like sports teams and you have us all here today and we all talk and you know there's no it'd be so much different if we were all like wearing like a red or a blue shirt depending on like what we and I would just automatically interpret all your opinions differently like label them but when it's just like us people and we're all talking it's just it's you realize that issues are so much more complicated and everything is just all separated and it's not just like you do on this side or you're on that side you know, there's just those sort of like instant yeah. things reactions. that you think of, like those yeah. reactions and those like, you sort of think of like the extreme when you hear right. certain words. So I've just been interested to hear like how those words have sort of, um, I don't know, taken on different meanings here or where people come from when they hear those specific words. We should all keep an open mind about it, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Not just go to the, that conclusion that you're yeah, getting. Right. But it's like you hear those, you know, those buzzwords and like, and your friends and your meeting, you use them all the time, so you just instantly think that you, you know, you have what your definition of that word means, right. but other people, it could be a completely different definition. We want people to be able to come into the conversation and certainly contribute, but we want them to consider things that they hadn't before. And so being given the space that they can hear some questions that they hadn't heard before, hear some ideas that they hadn't considered or hadn't been able to validate before, I think the most memorable moment in our discussion groups today was when we had two uh, self-identified political adversaries, you might say, agree with each other that they're all after the same thing, that our end goals are all the same, and that we're all working towards the same eventual uh, bettering of our society, and at the same time, they still identified themselves as adversaries. So though we're all looking for the same end game, our means of getting there make them opposed to each other. I mean, it is so simple um, to talk to people and listen to each other, and yet it's so hard to do. And I think when you have people who facilitate, it gets a little bit easier because we take a little bit of the pressure off. And yeah, we should be doing it all the time. It's just like these people are really complex, you know. As you get to know them more, you start to see the subtleties of their views and, and appreciate them, and you, and you can really, you know, really realize that we really can't be boiled down to, to just one or the other. Thing. You know, there's, there's a lot to a person and how they come to arrive at, at um, positions or, or whatever. And uh, it's cool to be able to just kind of be with that with people, you know, like, you know, just really just, just talk and be, you can be honest, and, you know, but respectful and uh, hopefully even empathetic, as you were talking about before. I don't know how many of us achieved full empathy here today. I'm still trying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but, but uh, that, that we try, we strive maybe to have that experience. I think that's that's good for for us. Awesome. Yeah. So. I just want to say it was a privilege to to be talking with you yeah. all today. We, I really had moments Definitely. of deep inspiration, knowing just we're doing this. That's cool. Well, thanks, thanks for the Yeah, great job. We need open dialogue. There is no question about it. Uh, the only way a democracy and a country can function is with open dialogue. You learn that you know, people in Tea Party are human beings. You learn that you, you'll, you'll talk to some people on the left, and you actually learn that they're concerned about the national debt as well. They, they just 
don't really want to spend us into oblivion. There's a lot of devil in details, but at least you got something to start with. At the end of the day, after the Sounds of Truth Festival, my biggest takeaway lesson was that we have a lot more common ground than we realize. People are much more willing to listen to opposing viewpoints than I realized. And people's opinions are much more nuanced and sophisticated than I give them credit for. What surprised me the most um, while I was there was that there, even though they could tell that there were barriers be between some of the people, everyone agreed that there's a big problem in this country right now and that we're in serious, serious trouble uh, with what's going on, the corruption in our country. And what surprised me is everyone really had that real sense that we had to do it now. We have to get together and unite now on what we can agree upon. I absolutely think that there is value in having conversations with people from differing viewpoints. I'm used to doing that with sort of mainstream Republicans, Libertarians, and, and, and Greens. But this went far beyond that. And uh, not conversations that I would normally have or the people who would be willing to listen to me. And uh, it's good to shake, shake yourself up every once in a while. You notice that people just interpret certain things that you've always had a, a set stance on, they interpret it completely differently. And if you just put yourself in their shoes, you can kind of see how, you know, maybe one way is kind of correct, and you just always assumed it was that way because that was what your political party stand, you know, stood for. And you can take little bits of what each, each different organization all thought. The Sounds of Truth was a fantastic event, and it got the ball rolling. You, you look at how people perceive politics, you look at how people perceive the, their, their respective ideology and you realize that we all have a lot more work to do and we all need to work better at communicating our concerns and what we think of the solutions with each other. It was a step in the right direction but it was the first step. If we really want to strike fear into the heart of the establishment and the people that we're up against is that we need to follow up um, with what we did instead of just talking. Uh, we do need to follow up and come together on what we've agreed upon. Listening to people that you don't necessarily agree with completely is crucial to building solidarity and to building a coalition in order to overcome problems with your government. It's how it's always been done with the civil rights movement, with the feminist movement, with uh, the free speech movement. All uh, people have told me that I am, um, I am on the far right and I wanted to see if through open discourse and truly communicating the reasons why I, I believe what I believe and some evidence behind it to see how many people would see it my way if I explained it in a moderate way not through pol polarizing um, through polarizing words what I took away from it is that so long as you're willing to listen think about what the other person has said then maybe incorporate that into your, th your own thought and see how then you can come up with a solution to balance both ideas out, then maybe you can, and maybe the Congress can, people who are actually in the positions of making these decisions, it can be done. And the simple idea is just listening, bouncing that back with, with your own ideas, and providing a solution that you know makes you happy, still upholds your beliefs, but also lets them know that they have been heard and that something in that solution, that idea of yours, they have been represented in some way. So why should you care? The tectonic plates of the times are shifting. The United States, humanity is reaching a precipice, a critical tipping point in one direction or another. And those of us that are aware see this quite plainly, others not so much, but history will always progress. And we have a decision to make in what way we want it to progress, right, as, as these plates are shifting. And I think on the one hand, you have a much more bleak future, as we can see with sort of what's been happening. And on the other hand, we see opportunity. We see the chance to build something better, something greater, right? We have the chance to experiment. We have this chance to come together and do something that history has yet to be seen. Uh, rebellious Truths accomplished what I didn't think would be able to be accomplished. They got a, a wide variety of different backgrounds, different people there. If we don't have groups like Rebellious Truths here, we're not going to be able to see the other side and we're not going to be able to find common ground. We, the youth especially, we have seen what happens when people don't care, when a society doesn't care, when a global society doesn't care. And 
it doesn't work out, right? And everyone's gonna say, well, you know, every generation, every history thinks theirs is the last, but you know, we're at a unique time and nobody can deny this. And it is up to us to, to change the trajectory of, of where we're at. And it's up to us to start experimenting with some, some radical notion. I'm so sick of people saying, well, it's impossible. Well, sounds of truth gave a glimmer of hope that something is possible that was once thought impossible. So yeah, I'm an idealist and proud of it, but I think eh, the world needs a little more idealism. Thank you for being a part of our journey. I hope that what our documentary and our journey has shown is a path ahead for you, our nation, and the world. If you can recall back the day after George W. Bush was elected president, those who opposed him began an assault and an attack, a verbal attack, that was unprecedented in our times. They were relentless in their opposition, in their dogma. 9-11 happened. Remember those days immediately following. We as a nation stood together, shared the grief and the loss of all those lives. It was a beautiful time to be an American. We stood together as one. It didn't take but a few weeks and the attacks were ratcheted up to a new level from those who opposed the presidency of George W. Bush. Fast forward now, a few years later, Barack Obama gets elected. The very next day, those forces who opposed him ratcheted up their level of attack even higher. What we've seen over the past 12 years has been a new level of divisiveness in our nation that in our lifetimes has not been seen before. It is time now for the people of this nation to begin to come together. It is time now for us to prepare the soil so that the day after this election that's upcoming, no matter which party takes the leadership role, no matter who becomes our president, we have to have prepared the soil so that as a nation, we can begin to grow and thrive again. I'm asking you to engage people now of different ideological perspectives, of different religious faiths. I am asking you to begin a new level of understanding now as we move towards this important election. Because we must prepare the soil so that the day after that election, those who we have, the people have chosen to lead us can truly lead this nation. Lead this nation in a new way that we have not seen in a long, long time. Lead this nation in a way where we can come up with those new solutions, those new nonpartisan solutions that not only gain bipartisan support and cooperation in Congress, but can bring the people of this nation together, that can be seen as accepted by most all of us. So I ask you to begin your personal journey, to implore those who you know to do the same. Let us sit down at this Thanksgiving and let's sit down and give thanks for all of the blessings that we as a nation have been given. No longer sit at that Thanksgiving table where you cannot speak to certain relatives and loved ones because of the divisive nature of the political differences 
that have divided us. Make this Thanksgiving, make this next year and the years ahead, ones that we will look back upon with pride that we were able to come together as a nation, come together as people. The time is now. We are all here in this country together. We are all here as Americans. Help us lead our nation and the world to new levels of freedom and liberty. Let us lead through the light of the truth.